identities. And so if y'all would turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. And we, I was meant to, uh, oh yeah, I realized I was laying in bed tonight and realized I hadn't mentioned this in a while. If you need a Bible, we have one for you. Please just raise your hand because we're going to go verse by verse. And we got some gentlemen back there who will be glad to give you one. So if you need that, raise your hand. They will find you and seek you out and all that good stuff. Um, now, last week I meant to get to these two verses, but we couldn't due to time constraints. So uh, we had a lot going on as we had this morning. So um, you're dealing with the, the Sermon on the Mount, and it is one sermon. And if you just read through it, I mean, you can get through it in a, in a timely manner. When it comes to, to teaching through it, that's another, that's another animal altogether. And what we have to realize is... As we take it over a few weeks, sometimes it can come across as being disjointed because you got a week in between. I would encourage you to read through, read the whole thing uh, each week um, to try to keep it together. But we're dealing, you know, how do you eat an elephant? One section at a time. You're not going to swallow them, at, swallow them all at once. So whereas we are able to delve into it a little deeper, it can, it can, can come across as being uh, not flowing or being a little disjointed. But there is a flow to this. And, and I would have last week had time allowed, we would have stopped between verse 16 and verse 17. So we're kind of stopping in a place that's not the natural pause in the um, in the sermon, but I think we can make it work. Um, Now, what I need you to do is imagine yourself on a hillside on the northern end of the Sea of Galilee. You're sitting there, and and of course, they don't have, you know, uh, they don't have guys running up and down there with those lawnmowers that cut the grass this tall. So it's kind of flowing. You can see it. Uh, if you're in that part of the of Israel, there's there are lots of flowers that are indigenous to here: ragweed, uh, you know, black-eyed Susan, some of the little daisies, and but they do have uh, red opium poppies. Well, you'll see them if you go to Israel with us next year. You'll see them if we're there at the right time of year, popping up here and there. But you see a little color, and they're sitting on this. Imagine yourself there, sitting on this sloping hill, probably that slopes down. Not it doesn't necessarily have to slope down to the Sea of Galilee, but it's there right around it. To the north of us will be a city that um, sits on a hill, actually, and we'll mention that later. And but where we are right now in the in the message is Jesus has just turned the religious world on its head. All right, what we talked about last week with the Beatitudes. And uh, he, he's not telling, if you do this, then you will be blessed. He is saying, blessed, congratulations, blessings on you, because you are the poor in spirit. Because of that, you shall inherit the earth. That is totally opposite to anything they've ever heard or been exposed to in their entire lives. They're accustomed to Pharisees roaming around and people thinking they walk on water. I mean, it's worse than, the way the Pharisees were seen is worse than women at an Elvis concert. I mean, it's just crazy. Um, so, there, and then Jesus comes along and says, these guys ain't what it's all about. And everybody's sitting around, just regular folks, like, did he just really say that? You actually had Jesus, we use the, term, the phrase here later today, light of the world. You had some Pharisees that were so famous and known to be such oh, great teachers and all that, that they were, some of them were mentioned as, he's the light of the world. So when Jesus throws this phrase in there, to a bunch of people that have heard it in that context, the way he uses it is really just blowing his mind blow for them. And we read it, and it's not maybe it's not mind blowing to us, but if I can paint the picture for you of the context at that time, maybe it will mean a little bit more to you. So Jesus has just turned the religious world on his head, and the good news is that you have found um, is that as a believer, you have if. If you have repented and trusted in Jesus, you are now qualified. In fact, as a believer, you are now in the kingdom. The kingdom is yours. You have access. And these are people that have been told all their lives, one way or another, you don't rate. You don't make the grade. You can't come in. Now Jesus comes and says, oh, yes, yes. You are at the end of yourself. You come into your rope. You realize, you realize Unlike the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and all that. Unlike them, you realize that 
I have no righteousness in me. To you who have been granted that revelation, who have repented of their sins, you are now in the kingdom of heaven. Now, coming off the end of that in the Beatitudes, we see that Jesus spoke uh, about how his disciples would be persecuted. If you look at verses, verse 10, it says, Blessed are those, blessings on, congratulations, happy are you, is what blessed means there, are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, congratulations, when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. Now, if they're telling the truth, I hate it for you. But if they're lying on you, that's a different story. The evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, but they're persecuting me. Yes, exactly. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And in that one fell swoop, Jesus links his disciples now. This is people from a Jewish background. And, and like I said, there might be four, might be 12, might be 100 there. Eventually a crowd gathers. I don't care how many there were. But these people, disciples, disciplined believers is what it means. These people are being linked to the prophets of old. Now, they've been given a link. They are not prophets of old, but they're linked. They have been, they're kind of thrown in the same category because the prophets were persecuted also. Jesus will make this point time and again in his ministry. Look, I've sent you the word. Every time I sent you somebody preaching the truth, y'all kill them. And they're going to kill Jesus too. But he told them, and eventually us also in no uncertain terms that there would be persecution for following him. Now in this country it's not really bad. They hurt your feelings. They wound your inner child. They exclude you from the click at the water cooler or the coffee pot or something like that. But nobody's getting shot or, or anything else in, around here for following Jesus. But you understand we, we still, they won't talk to me anymore. That's persecution somewhat, but, but the point is, you, yeah, if you're doing the job right, you can be persecuted. Not persecuted for being weird, okay? Not persecuted for the one who's walking around hitting people in the head with a Bible and at the office and, and, you know, every time you, oh, I broke my hand today, I was in a car wreck, praise God for the tribulation. Not that kind of weirdness. But someone who is consistent, a consistent, steady light, as we'll see later. And when this persecution comes, here's what happens. Because we have a tendency to circle the wagons, to retreat inside ourselves, into our cocoon, into our little Christian world, into our Christian community, into the church. The worst thing that could ever happen. It is absolutely the worst thing that can ever happen. What we have to understand, Christianity today as it's modeled on television and bookstores tends to be about us, doesn't it? And your best life now. <laughs> and, and, uh, and being the best person you can be. And being sweeter than Jesus. And it's all about you feeling happy and feeling good about yourself and all this sort of thing. So we can go through the day and, oh, poor soul, but I feel good about me. That is not what Christianity is about. It's not about us just becoming better people so we feel better about ourselves. So in order to avoid any sort of any sort of anything that's going to wound us, hurt us, bother us, any sort of thing that's going to be controversial, we retreat and we go to our comfort zone where personal ministry goes to die. Because I don't want to step outside of this because everything is lovely in here. I just love it. Jesus is so great. I love Jesus. I say, ah, no. <laughs> no. It's air conditioned in here and it's 100% humidity outside. I think I'll just stay in here. No. As we're going to see today, it's not about that at all. It's not about staying within our comfort zone. We are supposed to be active in the world and the community. And then we're not supposed to be on the defensive, but on the offensive. I didn't say to be offensive. <laughs> But we are supposed to be on the offensive when it comes to the gospel in Jesus. And Jesus tells us this in the next few verses. Look at verse 13 now. He says, you, speaking to these people, you are the salt of the earth. 
But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So now we come to the point excuse me, where Jesus takes the downtrodden and gives them, us, a part in his plan. Because believers are the salt of the earth. Now to understand this metaphor in the correct way, because salt to us is something you you know, put on your food. And where I'm from, salt is a blessing. You put lots of it on everything. <laughs> lots of it. Turnip greens, collard greens, ham, chicken, baked potatoes, uh, mashed potatoes, corn, anything. You just salt, 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 salt. And some of y'all are under the mistaken impression that that raises your blood pressure. Not so. Stanford has, has proven that. It's just a wives' tale amongst the medical community. But we think of salt like that, but not so in the first century as a totally different thing. Salt was a major, major, major commodity. It was so important in the ancient world because they didn't have refrigeration. So the re- only way you, you could preserve meat over any length of time was to pack it in salt and rub it in. Just rub the salt into it and pack it. You put it in a barrel and you put more salt in and more fish or more steaks or whatever because they were carnivores back then too, not vegetarians. And they throw stuff in there and more salt and stuff in there. Meat and salt. What better combination is there? <laughs> so anyway... You, you, salt was big because that was the way you preserved your food. Also, we get the term the Latin salarium or the salary. Roman soldiers were paid at some different times. In some point, at some point, some of their salary was paid. Salary, salarium comes from the word salt. Was was paid in salt. That's how valuable it was. You heard that they, that fellow's not worth his salt. That means he's not worth his paycheck. That's where the old expression comes from. So it was a means of currency, and it was an antiseptic. The Roman soldier, if they're wounded in battle, you got a cut. You know, somebody's chopped you off, chopped your arm off with a sword. The first thing you want to do is pour salt in it. Hey, I didn't see. You know, I didn't say it was fun, but it is an antiseptic. So it's a preservative, and it's an antiseptic, and it's currency, and it's a little bit of a spice. But to them, it didn't serve the same uh, purpose that we use it mainly for today. So we are the salt of the earth. What does that mean? And Jesus said, we don't just possess the qualities of salt. He said, we are the salt. We are the preservative, the church. We are the antiseptic. We might not be the currency, and maybe we spice it up a little bit. Well, most people would say we kind of bring them down when it comes to that because we're not, not supposed to be as wild as they are. But we are definitely a preservative and an, uh, and an antiseptic. Our very presence on this earth has a preserving effect on society. Well, how does that work? Well, I notice that people aren't quite as apt to speak up when they see something going bad are going bad manners in public as they used to be. I was walking down Stone Mountain with my family a few weeks ago and somebody was speaking foul obscenities and and screaming it out, making scene of themselves in front of the flags and I had about enough. So I said something. And they piped down. Praise God, because I was outnumbered. (laughs) But the point is, you can't just let stuff go. I didn't want to fight. But you can't be using that language. Women and children around, and they're just bowing up. And then people are walking by and say, say something. Somebody say, I had to say something. My son, who's a cop, was there with me. And he's like, Dad, there's five of them. And I said, I'm not worried. You usually take out the first one. The rest of them don't want to fight. He said, what about the 200 behind us? I said, you got them, right? <laughs> But the point is, uh, so, sort of like Edmund Burke said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. So there's lots of ways we can do good, you know, with that we're, we can vote 
for the right person. We can, we can get involved. The fact, if you're in a neighborhood and you just don't put up with garbage, you know, I remember years ago, I lived in the subdivision back home. We had some guys that were, it was obviously, it was obvious they were selling dope out of the house. So we're going to put a stop to it. And Dave Malosh, you know Dave. Uh, so what happens? We got a camera. Didn't even work, I don't think. We just stand there, and every time they pull in that driveway and go up there to that place, we film them, come in and out. Not really, but they think so. And you know what? They said, well, they stop. What are y'all doing? We're filming y'all going up there to buy drugs. Well, no, buying, who told you we're buying drugs, man? <laughs> but it's kind of obvious. So y'all filming right? Yeah, tag numbers and all. It, it ceased. We are a preserving factor. If you believe in a pre-trib rapture, as we do, then you see that that Jesus won't, he's going to take the church out. It can't go, everything go haywire during the tribulation period until the church is gone. In that sense, in an eschatological sense, we're also a preserving factor. Think of it this way. When good people move in your neighborhood, the neighborhood, good Christian people move in your neighborhood, the neighborhood ought to be safer and quieter. Property value should go up. If other types of folks move in, probably the opposite is going to happen. You understand? We have a preserving, we are supposed to be, or we are supposed to have a preserving effect on this, on this earth. Why? Because those things we read in the Beatitudes, what Jesus says later in the Sermon on the Mount, that's who we are. And that's what we do. We don't scare people off. We help people. There's the the, the Calvary Chapel in Tel Aviv, Israel. And the pastor there was talking about how he was, and there's, you know, of course you're surrounded by Orthodox Jews. The, there's a rabbi there at the, they had a yeshiva, which is kind of like their seminary, and the synagogue and all that. He comes up and he comes right up to the pastor there at the Calvary Chapel and he says, you know, I really want to hate you. And I really wish y'all would leave and that y'all weren't here. But you know what? I see what goes on. I see that y'all are feeding people and that y'all are working with the drug addicts and that y'all are helping the children, and y'all are doing this, and you're doing that, and you're doing that. And he said, I can't hate you as badly as I want to. That is the way we preserve, and we're an antiseptic to this world that we can obviously look out and see is going to hell in a handbasket. Now, that shouldn't take us by surprise because you read the book. But we cannot withdraw because the world is rotting. We are the only thing that keeps it from rotting off totally. We've got to go out there amongst them. And according to who is it? Stephanie has sent me that text from England. If anybody knows how to speak English, it's the English. Amongst is correct. <laughs> you should have seen if once or twice is correct also. <laughs> In Mississippi, it's good. Now, Jesus talks about how if the salt loses its flavor, what good is it for? And people, there's always going to be the one, the person there knows a little bit of science says, well, sodium chloride is a stable element and it cannot break down. Correct. Thank you very much. The point about this is that salt is stable, but all salt is not the same salt. And in that region, some of the salt is a pure type of salt that you want to put on your food. Some of the salt is not what you want to put on your food. There are certain types of salt or or mixtures of salt, especially as you get down toward the Dead Sea, it has bromine in it. And if you ever, if you get the chance to go to the Dead Sea, as I have, if you get, get water in your mouth, that's nasty. It burns. And so if it has bromine in it or some other certain minerals from that region, you don't put, you don't pack your food in that. Okay? So what do they use that salt for? They put it on the roads. They spread it on those Roman cobblestone roads, and it keeps the grass from growing up between the bricks. All right? Or if the Romans wanted to, uh, if they conquered a place, kind of a... a um, slash and burn type policy, they would take all that bad salt and they throw it in your fields. Guess what? You're not planting, you're not eating. You will bow to the Roman government at that time. 
All right? There was actually a place within the court of the Gentiles in the temple in Jerusalem that where they kept a lot of salt, and they would throw that out on the stones in the court of the Gentiles, sometimes for traction, if depending on the weather or what have you. So there is that type of salt that loses its flavor, but it's not used as a preservative. It's used more to kill. When uh, you see the, the stuff that's sprayed around here, I, ho- I got a homebrew, uh, not moon- moonshine, a homebrew, <laughs> A weed killer and salt is one of the ingredients in it, all right, because it just it just sucks the moisture out of everything. And that's what we're talking about here. If we don't, if we're not a preservative or an antiseptic, if we circle the wagons and just withdraw into ourselves, if we're so worried about it's so comfortable here, Jesus, let me tell you, this is, let me tell you a mystery, as the Apostle Paul will say. Jesus did not come to make your world so lovely and beautiful with rainbows and unicorns so that you would never be uncomfortable for the rest of your life. It's not a safe space. You know, there's not a constitutional right not to be offended. You understand? Jesus offended people. Nobody loved more than Jesus. Now, he didn't go out purposely just trying to be a dirt bag or anything like that. He just delivered the truth. And some people are offended by that. But if we don't act as a preservative, he says, then what purpose are we serving? What good are we? Are we dead weight? What good are we serving? He goes on to say that you, us, them, are the light of the world. He says in verse 14, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it on a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, we don't see anywhere in Scripture, I can't find it, where Jesus claims to be the salt of the earth. All right? He says we are that. But he does claim to be the light of the world. In John 8, 13, he says, Then Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. All right? We talked about um, John the Baptist uh, at the the earlier parts of Matthew. He said he used the uh, quote from the Old Testament talking about light has been given to the darkness up in Galilee where the Gentiles are, where the the Jews were that weren't seen to be as worthy or as religious or as smart or whatever, however you want to see it. So you got this dichotomy between light, the light that God gives and the darkness, which is a lack of knowledge of God. And he says, he goes on to say, we don't only possess a light, but like Jesus, we are the light. We bring light to the darkness. Now, once again, to someone that in their entire lives has been told that they're not worthy, Jesus says, you are the light. You're not merely a reflector. You are the light. Jesus is the source, but you are the light. Now, we can be a good light or a bad light, but we are a light. We are not becoming a light. We are not becoming salt. You are salt. Now, if you're a believer, you're salt. If you are a believer, you are light. The only question is, you know, what kind of light? Now, in Jesus' day, they had these little oil lamps, and I have one at home that I forgot to bring. They're not big, most of them. A little made out of clay. You pour olive oil in them, in them, and then you have a little wick that wicks the, the oil up, and you light it, and it makes a little... It's not a whole lot lighter than a big lighter, you know, cigarette lighter, old uh, Zippo, something like that. You know, so you can imagine at night, looking at, if you look into a house, it's kind of like watching the Eagles concert at night when they want an encore. Y'all seen that? Everybody holds up the lighter, which means play it again. Y'all, some of y'all don't know. Y'all just don't know good music. Some of you. But that's what you're accustomed to. It makes a little light. It's not a big light, it's not a bright light, but it is a steady light. And you don't put it down here on the floor, you don't stick it in a cabinet. If you want it to lighten more of the room, you had a little stand, just something to sit it on, a shelf, a stand, a table, something, so the light would kind of come out, you know, mushroom shape or whatever, and give more light. And they had to have several of these in the house, because they didn't just walk in and, oh, it's not like on television. You see the Westerns, they light that coal oil lamp, and they, they trim it up, and all of a sudden, pfft, it's bright. That ain't how it works. If you ever been without power for any, you know, we got candles. You know, you got the candle, and all you can see is that right there in front of you. All right. So, of course, nowadays they got those little solar lanterns that you know you recharge and and 
See, not, now even being without power is not as much fun as it used to be. We used to love when electricity went out. <laughs> because you could sit around and play games, you know, stuff like that. It was, it was different. I mean, everybody got quiet and it was family time again. But it was just a simple, steady light. You don't want to be a strobe light <laughs> flickering. Jake, I was thinking about our conversation <laughs> the other night. Um, you know, that, that look, looks weird. If you've ever been, you know, been to a disco, some of you, you know, that's, you see stuff about every two or three seconds, and everything is just jointed, you know, even though you're, being, you know, you're good and smooth with your mood. When the light's flashing, it's kind of like this. You don't want to be a strobe light. You don't want to be the disco ball hanging in the middle that you, phew, hits you in the eyes. With that. You don't want to be the interrogation light. Then the cops bring a guy in there, the, the, you know, the military does, and they shoot the light right in your face. You don't want to be that light. You don't want to be that guy. You don't, want, you don't have to be a laser light or an LED. You simply have to be a steady, consistent light. Why? Because you are the, what you are up against is darkness. And all that's required for darkness to leave is for light to be turned on. All right, even if it's a little light. It kills darkness to some degree. You don't want to be a dimmer switch, Christian. You adjust your light to the surroundings. You walk into a bunch of guys that are obviously not believers, we'll turn that thing down. After all, I don't want to be too much of a light to them. Don't want to upset them, you know. They might beat me down or what have you. And what that is usually is either fear or pride. Or some combination of both. And we just don't want to, we don't want to engage them. So we kind of just turn it down. It's a rheostat, it's what it is. And a rheostat uh, buffers or filters or compresses the amount of electricity going through the switch. So we got this light behind us, but we turn it down so not as much shines out. You don't want to be the dimmer switch Christian that adjusts his or her light to the surroundings. No, you got to be wide open. I got it, man. It's in me. Where is it? It's in there. Where? It's not shining right now, dude. You don't be too bright in front of all these people. These people aren't bright. You know, you don't want to be, you can't have that attitude. You know, we, we can't be a dimmer switch Christian. We are to shine it before men. And we're to shine it before them means so they can see. I don't know, we used to work on, uh, you work on anything, cars, airplanes, or whatever. There's sometimes you have to have both your hands, and we did have these little straps with a headlight, but sometimes you can't get that into this hole on the side of the airplane. So you got to have somebody hold a light for you. How many times? Hey, man, you hold that light? Sure, and they point it right in your face. You can't see anything. I mean, it's just every mechanic does it. Every mechanic does it. You know, it's kind of like walking by, and you grab the, coil wire and then reach out and grab somebody as they walk by and it, it shocks them. That's just something that's going to happen to God. We're not to shine it right in their face so they can't see. We shine it to light their way. It's not us shining us to them. It's not to blind them, but it is to help them. Our very lives are, are to be light in the darkness. And by living as Jesus empowers us to live, then we are to shine a light on this present dark age. Um, Ephesians 5, 8, 16. Let me, I'm going to read it out of, uh, I don't normally do this because I don't like paraphrases. But um, this kind of captures the nuance. This is Ephesians 5, 8 through 16 out of the New Living Translation. And this is the Apostle Paul talking about what it's like to let your light so shine before men. He says, For though your hearts were once full of darkness... Now you are full of light from the Lord, and your behavior should show it. For this light with you, within you produces only what is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, rebuke and expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But when the light shines on them, it becomes clear how evil these things are. And where your light shines, it will expose their deeds. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So be careful how you live, not as fools, but as those who are wise, Make the most of every opportunity for doing good in the evil days. 
Well, they're not talking about going around looking in folks' windows, shining a light and exposing them. That's not what he's talking about. But to be a light, you just shine on the darkness and you say, wait a minute, that's not right. We have a tendency, oh, I don't want to sh- don't rattle, the- I don't want to shake up anything, so I- I'll just be quiet. you got to pick your battles. And we're not to be that guy that everybody hates to come, see- to come walking through the office. We are to be a steady source of light. But if we don't speak up when things are going wrong, if we don't show the life and the light of Christ, they'll never see it. John 3, verses 19 through through 22 says this, And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Some of them don't know what the light is. We live in a generation that know what sin is. What is sin? That's a foreign concept. Or it's at least misdefined. Back where I'm from and back a long time ago, everybody knew what sin was. You heard it all the time. Now, what? Ah, it's a whole different world. If we don't shine it on that, that's how the culture goes a certain way. And a whole generation or generations don't know. It's not. You mean it's wrong to walk around with shorts with your stuff hanging out of it? You know, we live in a very ironic culture today. You got guys... Their pants are down here. And they're always trying to pull them up, you know. And I'm thinking, if you want to pull them up, just use your belt the way it's supposed to be used. Join the military. They'll show you where your waistline is right quick. Yeah. And then you got the ladies or women. It's cut up and makes Daisy Duke look like a nun. And then you know what? They're, you're right, they're like, oh. they're trying to get up, pulling them down. Just wear them down to begin with. That's the irony of this life. But if you've got a whole generation that doesn't know any of this stuff is bad, they've been told. Who's supposed to tell them? Well, the Bible talks about the older folks educating the younger folks. Well, they don't want to hear it. You know, maybe they do, maybe they don't. I didn't say you go chasing down everybody who's got on Daisy Dukes or everybody that's sagging, you know. But the point is, at some point, they've got to come across a light. And we've got... And, he who does the who, but he who does the truth, who, but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they may have been done in God. And now, and I want to get you to understand this today: that we're not being told how to get right with God. That is not what this is about. If we go that route, then we're no better than the Pharisees. We're not being told you better be brighter and saltier. In order to acquire salvation. It's not at all what's happening. We're being told how to live once we have been made right with God. We are being shown how people that have been made made right with God live their lives. Big difference. So how do we be made right with God? Jesus already talked about repent. Turn your life around. Change the way your way of thinking. Get converted is one way it's, it's a phrase. And believe on the, the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's how you get right with God. Now that that's happened, now this is how we live. This does not get you any righter with God than you were the day you were saved. You can't be any more right with God. Because at that point, His righteousness has been imputed to you. And it's 100%. It's not 110%. You're not gaining rewards points. You know, it's not a fluctuating level, you know, depending on what kind of day you're having. It's full. The account's paid in full. The price has been paid in full. You can't get any more righteous. That has been put in your bank account in heaven. But now, this, now that that's been done, this is how we live. Why don't Christians look different or act any different than the world? Probably because a lot of them don't want to. A lot of them haven't been, been taught anything. So it's not salvation by works, but it's evidence of our salvation by our works. James 2.18 says it's the very thing. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. You can't do it. That's the point. If I can't see it, it ain't real. Talk is cheap is what he's saying. 
and I will show you my faith by my works. That is how our light shines, is by people seeing what we do and how we act. You can talk it all day long. You can teach the greatest Bible study, but then they see you cussing somebody out Walmart parking lot. You haven't accomplished a thing other than to be labeled hypocrite. Back in the day, I was on staff at a church that they bought this brand new big copier. I mean, it was like the one we got in there. It does. It folds, collates, punches holes, colors it. But it'll do everything but deliver it for you. And so one of the guys came in that was working with the children, and he wanted to run off some copies. And the pastor's wife said, oh, don't be using it. Excuse me? Don't be using it. So he'd had to go downtown to the wherever, somewhere, and make copies. She didn't want you to use it because it might break. I guess you can buy a car, drive it home, park in the garage, and never drive it. The point is, if you use it, it might break. If you've got it, you've got to use it. It does no good to be issued a flashlight, and then all of a sudden we find ourselves in the dark. Man, we can't see. I got a flashlight. Well, get it out. No, I'll leave it in my pocket. Why? Well, the battery will run down. (laughs) Dude, we can't see. It does no good to have it and not use it. And that is what we tend to do sometimes. We couldn't use the copier. If you got someone that's got a flashlight, they don't want to use it. If you hang out with Chris Wilson, you're going to find out two things right quick. He's got a knife and a flashlight. And usually when we're hanging out, it's because we're working on something. And we need a knife and a flashlight. A hammer and a chisel helps too. But the point is, he's always got it there, and, and, and it's there to use. He, Jesus goes on to say, a city on a hill. You don't hide your lamp on their back. Why would you light anything and hide it? Why would you have a flashlight and stick it in your pocket? You are the light of the world. You cannot be hid. You cannot get under a basket. You cannot climb on a rock. You cannot walk within these four walls and just let it shine in here. Hey, we got enough of that in here already. It's got to go out there. He goes on to say a city on a hill cannot be hid. There's a city at the north end of the Sea of Galilee called by the name of Safed. It sits about 3,000 feet above the valley. Now, the Sea of Galilee is very, it's not as low as the Dead Sea, but they're in that same rift right there. And so it's still very low. And at, at night, because it was set so high and it was large and it had a lot of lamps at night, the fishermen could navigate by it. They knew that, that if you went towards Safed, you were essentially going true north or as close to it. You know where you could get your bearings. No matter what the clouds were, you could still see that. And so Jesus does this a lot, if you know the contextual background. When he's sitting somewhere, he's, he doesn't just say stuff. A lot of times he's pointing to something. A city, that's why I believe this would have been taught close to Safed. A city on a hill cannot be hid. Why are we hiding our lights? And why are we sticking our salt shakers in the cabinet? And never shaking them. Why, why do we do that? I want to, I'm going to take a little liberty right here. In that he says that the light on the lampstand gives light to who, all who are in the house. Now I'm taking a little liberty. This is a, I'm bending a hermeneutical rule. Which I don't, but I think it can work here. And what I mean is he says it gives light to all who are in the house. It starts at home. It does no good for us to be... Mr. and Mrs. Holy teaching Bible studies and leading this group and going out here and whatever you might be doing, praying with this group, feeding the homeless, uh, hungry, or what have you, and then go home and you are a loud, obnoxious, abusive husband, mother, child, wife, whatever. Starts in the house. Starts at home. And I know how hard it is. After you've been out all day working with people, you come home and you got to put up with this. Really, please. I just want some peace. It can't work that way. It has to start in the house. The goal and the goal of our shining is not let to peop, not, is not to let people see how shiny we are. It's not about us. It is Christianity, let me say this, is not about you nor me. 
And right here, it is about shining. Uh, we are to show them by our shininess is not us, but it's about showing them how our Father in Heaven has enabled us and empowered us to live this way. Told you everything. It's not like, everybody look at me. And that's why everybody wants fame and fortune. It's not about that. Everybody, you can see me, but you better see Jesus in that. Better see Jesus in me. Another key to the metaphor that Jesus uses is one of distinction. The world is rotting. We are the preservative. The world is full of darkness. We are the light. You know what that says? We have to be different. We can't be like the world to win the world. We can't open this up and have a big honky-tonk in here with a kegger and, and, you know, all this a bunch of heavy metal guys banging their heads on the wall trying to, oh, we got to get them in here to know Jesus. No. There's supposed to be a distinction. And that doesn't mean you can't relate to somebody. We don't walk around like the Pharisees. Make conversation. Be cool. All right? Hey, I'm all about being groovy. Okay, but at the same time, you don't win them by being like them. They see a difference. It's the distinction. How does this guy keep it together? How does this woman handle this? She's got all those kids and all this, and she's not dependent on drugs or anything else. Her husband's a dirtbag, and somehow she's able to make it. I want that. That's what they're supposed to see. We have to be different, but we have to be loving. And we have to see that we all have a place. We all have a job within the kingdom. Everybody, not just the smartest or the most educated. We are all salt and we are all light. And we are all to go out into the world. And we don't become disciples once we are salty or shiny enough. We become disciples when we've repented and put our faith in Jesus Christ. By that, you are salt and light. You don't work your way up the ranks. This is not, you know, Herbal Life or Amway or anything like that. We aren't being told how to become disciples, but we are being told how we are to live once we become disciples. So who wants to be a disciple? I asked that question a couple weeks ago. But if there's anyone that wasn't here or did not respond, then if I could have the musicians come up. Um, I'm going to ask you to stand and just bow your heads. I'm just a slight window here. If you don't know Jesus, if you want to know Jesus and, and you want to repent, you got to say, hey, man, we got people that can pray with you. I said, I would have you all stand, please. <laughs> Secret code, I guess. Thank you. Oh. Uh, then uh, I'm going to pray, and then they'll eventually, once they plug in, they'll start playing. But if you want to come down here and get that straight, it could be anything else. Then I want to invite you to take this one. And look, we saw that the other week. People came forward. Nobody got shot. Nobody got laughed at. Part of that was an exercise. That was almost an invitation nobody could refuse to be a disciple if you call yourself a Christian. One thing I want to do is get people just used to coming up here without feeling, who's looking at me? My shirt tucked in. You know, did I sit in anything on the way? No. It's not about that. If we can't move amongst family and those who love us who are, who are for the same cause, then what good are we going to be out there? We're certainly not going to shake our salt shaker and, and cut on our spotlight out there. So I would bow your hearts with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord God, for your grace and your mercy. And we thank you for your pronouncement that those of us who believe are already salt and light. And, Father, in your calling is your enabling. Lord, with the Holy Spirit, you empower us. Some of us are nervous. Some of us are quiet people. Some of us are, we're not debaters or, or theologians or anything else. That's not even, a lot of that's not what you're talking about. It's being a consistent light. Lord, we ask you to make us to be a consistent light. And, Lord, I would just ask you if there's anyone here today who doesn't know Jesus, the Lord, we can, you can be introduced to them right now. There's anyone who feels that they, they really need to just confess or, or they really want to be a disciple, more active, to really plug in and be more salt and light, Lord God, then, Lord, the window is open up for a little time up here right now. But, Father, we just ask you to work in our hearts. And, Lord, if any of this has stung us in any way, it's not you condemning us. It's you, Lord God, hoping to, to draw us to a subtle humble repentance and relationship. That's all it is. There's no condemnation within the body of Christ. 
Lord, you simply wish to draw us closer to you. And so, Father, as just for a little while longer, Lord, as, as we leave this window open, Lord, just praying. Lord God, hoping if anyone needs to come and be reconciled to you in any way, then that would happen. Praise the Lord. We've got elders, ladies, anybody. Father, we thank you, Lord God. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you, Lord God, for the way you've spoken to everyone here. We just ask you to move mightily, Lord God, in all of our hearts. Let us understand our saltiness and our lightedness. Lord God, thank you for the grace that works in us. Lord God, now, as we leave here today after worshiping you, Lord, I pray that we not put this in our back pocket. We walk out of here salt in hand, flashlight, spotlight in hand. For whatever situation we come across, Lord, that we consistently shine and point people to you. For that, Lord God, we thank you. We praise you, dear Lord God, and we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.